is a plethora of myths floating around out there about game masters. A game master should never do this. A GM should always. However, most of it is just a bunch of bull crap. So today we're gonna be discussing the top 15 dungeon master myths and why you should not believe them. I think I got that right. It's like 15, right? Boom, boom, boom. Hey. Number one. A game master should have a fully realized and prepared game world for the players to explore before the campaign begins. Yeah, right. Are you kidding me? You're gonna plan out the entire world before you even start your campaign? You're gonna so so you're gonna spend years creating every country, every nation, every principality, every kingdom, the cities in those, all the different races and peoples and NPCs, all the taverns and inns, the castles the guards, the soldiers, everything that they're wearing, the customs, the holidays, the calendar. You're gonna get all of that done before you ever start playing your game. Yeah, yeah you are. And you're gonna be doing it for the next 10 years. So no, no, you don't gotta have it all done before you start playing your game. Even if you're using a pre-made setting, you have to read, learn, and study. It's just too much to expect a game master to be able to do it all before they even start running their first game. Thinking that you need to be completely ready for anything in a tabletop role-playing game just means that the game will never actually start. You're never gonna feel like you're totally ready. You're always gonna feel like there's one more thing that I could prep beforehand, or there's one more thing for me to feel confident and ready so that I don't like freak out and not know what to do in my game session. You will never be ready. Accept it, embrace it, it's okay. Go play your game with your friends and have fun. That doesn't mean not to try to get ready and not to prep. I'm not saying don't prep. I'm not one of those guys who's like, don't do any prep. You know, because the moment, the moment you prep anything, your players are gonna screw it up, so you might as well have not prepped. I am not that guy. I am a firm believer that a game master will not rise to the occasion, but they will fall to their highest level of preparation. So do your prep, do your due diligence. Just don't need, don't like think that you're going to be ready because you're never gonna be ready. You're just gonna be as ready as you can be. I know it probably doesn't make sense, but you'll understand later when you're older. Okay, that sounds condescending. Uh, Editor Zach, cut that out. You get my point, guys. You get my point. In fact, a lot of you are probably my age or older, so you probably know this better than I do. You know what? You just stop, stop watching my videos, all right? You guys know things better than I do, all right? Just thank you, but I appreciate the support. Number two, a game master has to be a player first. Look, when I first started playing Dungeons and Dragons in like 1997, I think it was, I wasn't a player. Dude, my grandma bought me this book from a store because I thought it was cool. The cover looked amazing. I got home and I discovered that it was actually a game. It was the second edition player's handbook that I got. I'm like, this is a game? Amazing, I can play this with my friends. Wait, I don't have any friends. I can play this with my brother. I will blackmail my brother into playing this game with me. Yay. Actually, we had this thing where like, I would play a game that he wanted to play and then he would play a game that I wanted to play. And so I had to play probably like Life or something horrible like that. And then he would play D&D with me and it was, it was worth it. Playing Life was a sacrifice. Um, it's like the world's most pointless game with no, ugh. but it's like Candyland, right? It was a sacrifice, but it was totally worth it. Anyway, my point is that I had never been a player. I didn't even know it. it was a game. And I just started running it and we just started having fun. And it was amazing. In fact, I was a game master for years into college. No, after college. Yeah, you know, it was college before I was ever a player. I played through high school, through parts of college before I was ever a player. I was a pure game master, that's it. So the person who tells you that you need to be a player first is full of crap. Now. Is being a player first possibly beneficial? Sure, why not? But it's not required. A lot of great game masters have never played or didn't play until they have been running the game for years. And being a player can make you a better game master, yes, but it isn't even guaranteed. In fact, you could be a player in a game with a horrible game master and learn the wrong things actually making you worse. Unless of course you do what I do. When you're in a game with a bad game master, you take notes and you you note down and, and remember the things that they're doing poorly that make the game suck for you. And then when you go do your game mastering, you make an intentional effort not to do the things that they're doing that made the game suck for you. I've literally done that before. I literally was in a game that I did not like. I stayed with it for a while. 
intentionally to observe the game master and take notes and remember all the crappy stuff he was doing so that I wouldn't do it in my own games. I, I'm dead serious. I literally did that. <laughs> Like I would tell my, when I was going to the game, I'd tell my wife, oh, I gotta go to that game. And my wife was like, why are you going to that game, Luke? You don't even like that game. And I told her, because the game master sucks and I'm taking notes. Literally, this is what I would tell her. I'm like, I am learning from this guy because I'm gonna, I'm gonna become a better game master myself by suffering under his tutelage. Okay, so if you've never actually played though, here's what you can do. There is a plethora of actual plays out there that you can go watch to give you an idea of how games go. Bear in mind, lots of people run their games lots of different ways, so there's gonna be a variation of styles that you see out there. Now, I personally have my Thieves Abound game on my channel right here. You can go out and watch that whenever you want. We have new uploads roughly every two weeks or so. However, bear in mind that watching a game doesn't show you what is going on behind the screen what the game master is doing. Oh, and I would caution you too to, when you go out and you wanna watch these actual plays to see how an actual game is played, I would recommend watching an actual play. But what I mean by that is you want to see a game where the people there are actually playing the game. Like that's what they're doing. Like they sit down and they're playing a game of D&D or Pathfinder or Call of Cthulhu or whatever because there are lots of actual plays out there that aren't really actual plays. There are folks who are putting on a show to entertain the viewers and it's not really, I mean, it. I don't know, I'm probably gonna ruffle some feathers here, but it's like, it's a game, but it's not a game because they're putting on a show and their their primary purpose is to make the viewers be entertained. I, I hesitate to say that it's not a real game, but it's not the type of game that most people would play in their basements or their garages or wherever you guys go play your game. So try to find a game where people are literally just, hey, we're playing the game, here's a camera pointed at it, you can watch if you want, I don't care. But once you get into the, the realm of people trying to put on a show, they're not, playing the game so much as they're just putting on a show. And then you're getting less of a look at what a real game is and more a look at people who are trying to become internet famous or something. I hope that makes sense. I hope people aren't mad at me. And if you are, you know where the comment section is. Why I have like a paid army to go into the comments and like, you know, <laughs> respond to everybody that's just yelling at me. It's a good tea, by the way. Oh, and by the way, if you're looking to be a game master and you've never played before and your first time, whatever, whatever, there are tons of resources to learn how to game master. I mean, we have this channel here. There are other channels out there. You got Matt Colville. You got how to be a great GM. Who else we got out there? Professor Dungeon Master, if you go to Dungeon Craft channel. Who else does good game mastering channels? Oh, yeah, my buddy, my buddy. Uh, Dungeon Masterpiece, what's his real name? He's a Baron. Crap, what's his real name? Hold on, I'm gonna look up his real name. I have his phone number. I met him at Gen Con, he's a really cool guy. And now I'm like publicly in a video, can't remember his real name. I think it's Ryan. Ryan DeBaron or something like that. Wee. Yes, Ryan Baron de Romp. Yeah, Dungeon Masterpiece, good channel. Go check that crap out. I'm sure there's some other people that have really good Game Master advice channels that you can go check out that I forgot to mention. Oh, Dungeon, my dude, my dude, what's his name? Come on. Alan, Alan, what's the name of your channel, dude? Dungeon Coach, Dungeon Coach. Go check out his channel. He does like homebrew stuff. He's cool, he's awesome, I love that dude. So, I'm like, he's, I love that dude, but I couldn't remember the name of his channel. Hey dude, today's a special day, all right? Anyway, go check these folks out. There's lots of information out there, lots of people that you can learn from. You can get books too, to help you game master. I got some books right here that are cool. This is one that I'm gonna recommend, Arbiter of Worlds by Alexander Macris, I think. This guy is cool, I like this book. There's a lot of solid stuff in here. So you can get books too that help you learn stuff, is my point. So there you go. I'm gonna move on to the next point now. I feel like I belabored this point. Yeah. Number three, a game master should never let the players in on their plans. Okay, so while a player should never be completely spoiled on an adventure or plot element, sometimes collaborating with the player on an idea or element of the plot can have some upsides. It can give you as the game master some new ideas or a new perspective. It can increase player investment and buy-in. Like look, if you are working with a player, perhaps it's that hesitant or quiet player, 
and you want them to become more involved in your adventure when it's finally getting played out. Plot with them, like connive with them, scheme with them, get them in on things, find, work together to find something that, something they like about their character, about the game, that you can work together on to bring it into the game, something that's gonna get them excited, something that will get them invested, something that will be like, look at, I helped create that thing. Dude, that could be so cool. That could be one of the most special things a player does in a game is like participate on a grander level than they're accustomed to. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that could be amazingly cool for your games. Now, if you don't want to do that, that's fine. You don't have to. But what I'm trying to say is that there's no rule or reason that you can't do that if you don't want to. And the chances are your players are probably gonna like that a lot. Now, I personally tend to do this rather sparingly in all honesty, but I know there are lots of other game masters who do it a lot. And I recommend that you find your style. You find the thing that you enjoy doing, the thing that your players enjoy doing, and then rock and roll. Number four, a game master must know all the rules, including player character abilities. All right, okay, let, let's just take a look at this, shall we? Okay, where is, okay, here we go. Bestiary, you gotta know everything in this one. Ugh. Got Game Master Guides, Game Master Guides. Hold, hold on a second. Wait one moment, please. See, this one right here <laughs> is literally on my desk because I'm constantly studying this thing and trying to read and know these rules to run this game better. All right, but that's not just it, all right? And I'm just showing you Pathfinder 2 books. The same stuff is out there for like D&D 5e or whatever you're playing. There are tons and tons of rules. All right, oh, the Advanced Player's Guide. Make sure you know all that stuff. What else we got over here? Oh yeah, we got guns and gears and like, oh, look at this, oh. All of the ancillary books. We have Secrets of Magic, Dark Archive, Book of the Dead, Treasure Vault. Yeah, okay, sure. You read and learn all of those rules and have them memorized. And good luck to you, good sirs and ma'ams and you're a cat running the game. Well, hey, good. Have fun learning the rules. My cats would never, my cats would sleep on the books is what they would do. <laughs> Yeah, that's what my cats would do. This is what you actually wanna do. This is the truth. You do the best you can. Yes, read the rules. Yes, brush up on them before the games. Yes, when you go to the throne, take a book with you, read it. It'll help, trust me. I used to lie down before every D&D &D game and read bits from the player handbook or dungeon master guide for about 30 minutes to an hour before all of my games. I already read this stuff before. I might have even known the rules already, but I did it anyway. I would study and I would read them just to get fresh on them. And now I do the same thing for Pathfinder 2 games because I'm learning them, the rules still, and there's a lot of them just like any other game. And well, yeah. But I also want you to remember this. You will learn the rules best when you use them in your game. Just make sure that you're actually using them. I say this because I have actually been in and seen games that barely even use the rules. Everything is just like made up on the spot, which I suppose if you're running a game like that, there's nothing wrong with that, but you need to acknowledge that you're not actually running that game system. You're just kind of doing whatever. And as long as you acknowledge that and you are okay, and then I think we're straight, but don't tell me that you're playing Pathfinder 2 or D&D 5e and then never use the rules because that's just not true. You're just playing a fantasy game whose rules and mechanics you're making up on the spot. And that's cool. I'm not knocking that. Just don't tell me you're following the rules when you're clearly not. You should like advertise your games as like generic fantasy game whose rules I will make up as we play. Don't worry, it's easy. Everything is by Game Master Fiat, which is either refreshing or terrifying to you. We'll find out. That's the problem with not using rules. When everything is by Game Master Fiat, you are at the mercy, 100% mercy of your Game Master. You have a wonderful Game Master, wonderful game. Tyrannical Game Master, probably not a good game. Rules are actually kind of cool and they are useful for a wide variety of reasons in my personal opinion. Furthermore, as I continue this tirade, tirad, tirade, would you guys let me know in the comments? I don't know, I can't speak. I also wanna say that the players should be responsible for knowing the rules governing their characters, their spells, their abilities, etc. I do feel that the game master should be familiar with them when they're able to, but the character, the players really gotta pull their, pull their like stick, pull their side of the bargain, pull their, 
pull their cart. There's a there's a metaphor or an analogy here or whatever you call that thing that I can't quite get, but the players bear a part of this responsibility as well. The game master can be responsible for all the rules everywhere. In fact, I will say that as I'm running this game, where is this big book? As I'm running this with my players, I am like almost exclusively focused on the rules I need to know as the game master to run the game. All of the rules that govern the characters, the player's characters, that's on them. There's not enough room in here for me to get everything all at once. So they are responsible for knowing how their characters work and Eventually I'll get there, but not today. Also, I want to make a quick little note here too that it is okay for you as a game master to need to reference the rules during the game or even to make quick rulings on the spot or invent things on the fly as you go. I try to follow the rules when possible. When I think it's important enough to look the rule up, I'm gonna look the rule up. But there are other times where the rule isn't that big of a deal. I'm gonna make a quick ruling on the spot so that we can keep the game flowing and we don't bog down. And then later on, I'll look it up and I'll figure out how it was supposed to have worked. And I learned from it. Number five. A good game master is an impartial adjudicator of the rules and should never fudge or adjust in the player's favor. Now, while many, including me, believe that dice fudging is generally bad, it's okay for a game master to make adjustments to hit points, how much damage a creature does, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we talked about following the rules and now we're gonna talk about like breaking the rules. I suppose. Anyway, I personally do this most often if I made a mistake in my planning and have either one, placed the characters against a challenge that is beyond their capability, or two, given them a challenge so underwhelming that they will be disappointed. Then I will either ratchet it down or ratchet it up. There's a, see, the, the tonation is very important there. Yeah, right, we're good. Now, some people are gonna tell you that they believe that game masters doing things like this are cheating. And if you're interested in that topic, I have a video titled Seven Ways Dungeon Masters Supposedly Cheat in Dungeons and Dragons if you'd like to learn more. I will put a link for that, woo, somewhere around here. By the way, this Thursday, September 7th, is the last day to back our Kickstarter, The Secret Art of Game Mastery. If you're a new game master feeling a bit overwhelmed with everything you need to do, or you're a veteran looking for new tips and tricks to take your game to the next level, this book is probably gonna help you. In fact, I talked about all the different things and resources that are out there for game masters who are learning, and this is probably one of them that I can definitely stand behind because, well, my team and I wrote the darn thing. What we did is we distilled our century, like literally like a lot of experience, of game mastering into this one easy to read guide of practical advice you can immediately apply to your games. Practical. It's not this esoterical stuff where you're like, how do I even, what? No, this is practical stuff you can implement in your games to make them better. You can learn how to create campaigns and adventures your players will love, hopefully. <laughs> Decrease your prep time, explore the core pillars of RPGs, gain insights into dealing with problem players. That's always a fun one. Problem players, woo! A and more, of course, we just packed everything that we can into this book for you. And to make this problem even more valuable to you, more value, more cool stuff in it, we are giving you two additional books as well. The Secret Art of Preparation takes the actual templates I use to prepare my games, tweaked and improved for publication, of course, and gives it to you in a beautiful and easy to use format. We've also created The Secret Art of Note Taking to help you keep track of your campaign easily and effortlessly. It actually involves writing and doing stuff. Like nothing is easy and effortless in this game, okay? This is just like marketing stuff that my people told me I have to say, but it's gonna take work. Running an awesome game takes work, but these resources here can help you. And remember, The Secret Art of Game Mastery is written for game masters of all systems and genres. Any game, any system, any genre, it doesn't matter. We made this for you. It's not for one specific thing like D&D or something. It's for everybody. So there's a link down below that you can click to learn more and back the project before time runs out. You gotta put that whole like fear of missing out stuff into these announcements. It's just, I don't know, my marketing people, what are you gonna do? It literally is gonna close soon. So if you're interested, you should go take a look at it. <laughs> Number six, the game master needs to buy everything. I, I'm not sure if this is an official myth, like official myth myth or if it's just a de facto myth. Lots of times I see and hear that game masters buy everything their groups need. Books, they buy the books, like the books. 
my big pile of books that I have here. Yeah, Game Masters have to buy all the books. Ugh. They gotta buy the dice, they buy whatever. The Game Masters gotta buy everything. Like, de facto, this is what we see happening. And the players just like freeload, I guess. I don't know, that's the impression I get from some of these stories I hear. And I hear these stories and I, I push back on them and I, and I tell Game Masters that their players should be chipping in as well, especially if it's something that the player would be using. And the Game Masters usually tell me something like, well, my players just wouldn't buy it and, and then we wouldn't be able to play. And while that probably is true, True in some cases, it's also very messed up and unfair. Like, everyone should contribute to the extent that they are able. Everything should not just fall on the Game Master's shoulders. Like, we recently started playing Pathfinder 2 like a few months ago, and guess what? My players are buying books for themselves to use. They buy their own dice and minis and stuff too. It's kind of crazy how they do that because that's what they should be doing. They should buy their own supplies. It's reasonable and it's okay to expect them to buy stuff that they're gonna be using. And if they were to buy me, you know, a slice of pizza or something every so often, I, I take bribes, I, I take bribes, okay? Number seven. It's the Game Master's responsibility to ensure that the players have fun. Holy crap, no, 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 no. It is not the Game Master's job to make sure everybody has fun. You cannot control for fun. Like. Line up, sit down at the table. All right, you're all gonna have fun or else. And you can't control for player preferences. Like even the best game masters will have some players that just don't like their games. I've had players leave my games because they probably weren't having fun. Like they didn't tell me that. They would give me the standard socially acceptable reasons. I don't have time or blah, 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 whatever. But my gut for some of these guys that have left is, well, they weren't having fun or they didn't, yeah, whatever. It happens to everybody. Every, no, no game master out there is immune to this. You cannot run a game that everyone everywhere will have fun in. You cannot do it. It is impossible. Another point I wanna make here too is that as a game master, you are supplying the adventures, the world, the NPCs. You're doing a whole lot of stuff but the players must put something into the game as well if they wanna get something out of it that they're going to really enjoy. Somebody once told me that you get out of the game what you put into the game, and I think there's a whole lot of truth to that. Anyway, my theory, my philosophy is this. All the Game Master can do, all you can do, is create the environment where fun might be had. However, you cannot force players to have fun. You cannot guarantee fun. Number eight, a game master is a storyteller. I actually have an entire video on my channel that debunks this myth. So I'll just keep this rant brief. The game master creates the situation, the scenario, the adventure. How the player characters interact with that situation is what actually creates the story. In tabletop RPGs, the story is the confluence of the game master's world and adventures and the player's actions in that world and the adventures. As a game master, you are not the storyteller. You are a storyteller, perhaps, I will concede you that much, but your players are equally as much storytellers as you are. Together, all of you, collaborate, 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 cooperate. You guys, you all do something together to make a story out of it. Like through the course of gameplay, a story results. But you as a game master are not sitting there in advance. What's the story gonna be? I'm gonna write the story. That's, that's not what you do. That's not what you do. Number nine, a good game master never says no. This is also known as the yes and improv philosophy. However, RPGs are not improv. They're not pure improv. There's an improv element to them, but they're not pure improv. However, RPGs do have improvisation in them and thus do integrate elements of improv. But the yes and philosophy of improv applies to improv itself when it's used in the game. To think that a game master can never say no is ridiculous. Sometimes players want to do things that are in direct conflict with game rules or the reality of the world in which the characters live. Most times a game master should use yes but, I believe, instead of saying no. However, there are definitely times when a game master, or a player for that matter, needs to say no. So if your players wanna do crazy stupid crap that's just not possible, you are fully within your white, your white, right, 
dear Game Master, to tell them no, that's not possible. No, you can't do that. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't say no when it makes sense to do so. Now, your players might throw a fit. That's possible, but what are you gonna do, right? Just like live in fear of your players throwing temper tantrums? Mm, I would rather not do that myself. Because there are players that will throw temper tantrums and it's sad. There are also game masters who are jerks and say no to everything. That's also very sad. So don't be one of those jerks, right? Like, <laughs> try to be a nice human being, right? Try to let your players do cool stuff and don't be a jerk and just say no because I'm the game master and that's, that's the way it is. There's a balance to be had, right? There's a balance. Number 10, a game master has to be a performer. By this, folks are trying to say that a game master needs to be a master actor. A singer, if it's, if you gotta be a singer, oh wow, I failed, I'm a bad game master, let me tell you something. A voice actor, I'm probably not good as a voice actor either. A narrator, I can narrate, I can do that, okay. But anyway, they're gonna tell you that you gotta do all of these things, you gotta be great at it to run a good game. And that's just absolutely silly, and I would fail that test myself. Very few people in the world are any of these things. A master actor, a master singer, a voice actor. And if the requirements are to be a good game master, you gotta be all of those things, well, then there would be very few game masters anywhere out in the world. Like you'd all just suck because you don't click check all of these nice little boxes that we got out there. Now, will these things help? Probably, most assuredly. Are they required? No, absolutely not. You focus on being the best game master you can be, using the skills and talents you have and let everyone who tells you otherwise go sit on a parking cone. I don't really know what that means. I've been saying that for a long time and I have no idea what it means, but it, it sounds cool. If you think sitting on a parking cone sounds cool, just let me know it in the comments. I think it sounds pretty funny. I got a lot of people in the comments right now telling me it's stupid and I should shut up. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. Number 11, the game master is in competition with the players and should try to win. The game master is not there to win, whatever that means. 99% of the time, the monsters the game master controls lose. And most RPGs are designed that way. Like, you're you're supposed to lose, Game Master. It's, it's like part of the game. But we don't define winning and losing the same way in tabletop RPGs as we do different games, do we? In my personal opinion, winning and losing is is measured by the fun that we had at the end of the night. If we all left and we're all excited and we had fun, then we all won. My bad guys are all dead. The characters are probably all alive. But if we all had fun and it was a great game session, I won as a game master. Anyway, the players are there to have their characters win over the bad guys, yes. But the game master's goal is not to have the bad guys win. The game master has a different role in the game than the players do. The game master, how many times am I gonna say game master in this video? Somebody's counting. Somebody let me know how many times I've said game master. Keep a count going. <laughs> <laughs> Your job, dear Game Master, is to create conflict and present challenges. But at the same time, the GM should be the player's greatest cheerleader. You should want them to win. Now, although on the surface it may appear that they are trying to have their bad guys defeat the player's characters, the Game Master actually should be rooting for the player's characters to win. It's like, what should be in here? Like, I'm gonna challenge you, it's gonna be hard, but I want you to win, guys, I really do. Bottom line is the Game Master is not there to be the player's enemy. By the way, if you're finding this information useful, please give me a thumbs up and share this video with others. One of the best ways you can help other Game Masters is by sharing helpful content. I just, total sleaze right there, but thank you. Number 12, the Game Master can do anything they want. Well, this is technically true. You should consider the natural ramifications if you implement this without reasonable boundaries. I mean, you can do anything you want as a game master. You can do anything you want. But it doesn't mean your players are gonna stick around to witness it. At its heart, this is a group game. And when the game master does things the players don't enjoy or don't agree with, the quality of the game will suffer and your players might just walk and find a different game master. So just because you can do a thing doesn't mean that you should. Holy crap, there's like 15 of these points? Wow. <laughs> Normally we do 10. Sorry guys, but we had a lot to talk about, I guess. 
Number 13, the Game Master can change the rules at any time. All right, this is another technically true one. Yes, the GM can alter the rules, but if you don't have player buy-in and agreement on the changes, you'll likely find yourself with some upset players. Trust me, I know, I've tried doing it before. It doesn't work that well. <laughs> Furthermore, changing the rules should not be done on the fly. Instead, it should be carefully considered and discussed with your players. Again, ideally we're looking to get agreement on the changes from everyone at the game table. Sure, this isn't always possible, but it's definitely preferred. Now, the Game Master can make exceptions to the rules on the spot for specific circumstances, but they really shouldn't make long-term changes to the rules without informing the players in advance and hopefully getting their buy-in on it. Any rules changes should be made to enhance the game, not to penalize the players or Game Master or put anyone at a deliberate disadvantage. Change the rules to increase the fun, to make things better for folks, not to just be like, bop, <laughs> you suck. That's just trash and stupid, right? Number 14, you should be more like Matt Mercer or Brennan Lee Mulligan or insert name of famous game master. Like it is just simply a lie that one game master needs to be like another. Every game master is different and no GM should be compared to another GM or told that they must do something that another GM does. On a kind of related note, like when I was first starting this YouTube channel right here, I had like no subscribers and no views and I'm making videos. And there was this one girl that kept on telling me like in comments and on Facebook and stuff, Luke, you know, if you'd be more like this person here, you'd be more successful. And they were referencing somebody else in the D and D niche who had a pretty decent sized YouTube channel and was being pretty successful. And I'll tell you what, every time that girl told me that you should be more like that person over there when you make your videos and stuff, I gotta tell you, man, it rankled right in here. And now, and I stuck to my guns. I kept making my content the way I wanted to make my content. And now, I, 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 I like to think that she knows that I was moderately successful and things are going okay for me now, even though I refused to be more like that person that she was telling me that I should be more like. Yeah, now I get to like kind of rub it in her face a little bit. So anyway, the point is, the point is you be you. Of course, players can make suggestions, right? but no game master should be forced or even necessarily encouraged to try to be like everyone else. Now, can you learn from other game masters? Could I learn from that other YouTuber and the way they were doing things? Yes, absolutely. However, you are who you are with your unique personality and style. Let no one measure you by an erroneously established standard. I think I like pronounced erroneously very poorly. It was like all slobbery, like erroneously. <laughs> Just, you know, you're your own standard, baby. Having fun is the goal, right? not trying to copy someone else and be like somebody else out there. Actually, there's nothing wrong with having higher standards, something to aspire to, right? Like, there are things I aspire to, you know, and I want to be better at certain things like other people, right? I'm still myself, you know, I still am who I am and I shouldn't feel bad that I am not like that other person, right? It's about growing and challenging yourself and stretching yourself and becoming more than you are today. Tomorrow being better than what I am today. Number 15, a game master is a therapist. <sighs> Some people are gonna like really not like what I'm about to say here, um, but we're gonna do it anyway because yeah. There is a belief spreading through the tabletop RPG community these days that players should make characters that help them explore their own psychology and problems, that tabletop role-playing games are therapy and part of the Game Master's job is to facilitate that. Now, I don't know about you, but I am not a licensed therapist, and if one of my players needs therapy, I would suggest to them that they should probably go see a professional. It would be a poor expectation to think that my game that I'm running just because I wanna have fun is gonna give them the help that they need. Now, might our tabletop RPGs be helpful for them? Of course, sure. Many people get amazing benefits from playing D&D with their friends. And I know that there are licensed therapists that use tabletop RPGs to help their clients. I know that that's a thing. However, I'm not a licensed therapist and it is not my responsibility as a game master to render aid and do all I can to help someone who needs professional help. I'm here to run a game. I, I'm not here to provide therapy. Like I, I love people, I wanna help people, but 
Like that's not what I'm doing the game for. Furthermore, I wanna say this too, never feel bad if you have to ask a player to leave your group because of their poor behavior. Like it's not your responsibility to play doctor or parent, even though some folks might try to guilt trip you into doing it. If a person needs therapy, a therapist is who they should be seeing, not their game master. I know I have lots of angry people in the comments right now. I know I do, I know I do. <laughs> but anyway, that's just what I think. What do you think? What are game master myths you've heard floating around out there? Or what are some things that you wanna yell at me about? You know where to do that. Also, don't forget to back the secret art of game mastery at the link below. This Thursday is the last day to back the project. It's going to close. Now, if you'd like to learn some of the tricks that professional game masters use to make their games amazing, watch this video right here. And until next time, happy game mastering.